I speak to you in the name of the living God, blessed Trinity, and lover of your souls. Amen. Bombs whistle overhead as I shuffle four children into a basement cellar. The room's singular small window is set near the ceiling and carved from concrete. It stands agape to streaks of color peeling the night sky while gray walls dance with blasts of sunsets. Through that intermittent light, I watch one boy and three younger girls huddle in the corner, still wearing their night clothes. The boy's rigid shoulders tell me he is trying to be strong. No tear touches his eyes. But the girls, their strength comes from each other. Their hands cling to one another against pressed bodies. And I tower over them all, shielding their small frames with the span of my arms at the sound of each crash. My embrace feels endless. No one will separate me from them. Steadily, my heart beats. My grip holds firm. Only my eyes give away the fear I feel underneath. Eyes that swallow the destruction I alone can see from the window. Surely this is the end of the world. I pause my story and look up into the ruddy face of a chaplain sitting across from me. His name is Carl, and I knew I liked him from the moment we first met. He is short and brown and round, and his eyes that peek over tiny spectacles reassure me I am well listened to. My story about a bunker at the end of the world was born from Carl's question. He asked me if I have a secret place inside of me where I go when I am afraid. I told him about this reoccurring dream that I'd had for years, protecting my brother and my sisters at the end of the world. Carl blushes with an apologetic smile. I had no idea that would be the world you would share inside of you, he said sheepishly. My secret place is a garden with squirrels. Carl tells me that he goes to this place in his mind and heart and talks to the squirrels and the bunnies and they talk back to him and reassure him that everything will be okay. We stare at each other with incomprehension. <laughs> there is an inherent strangeness to the secrets within each of us. I would not feel safe in Carl's garden exposed with only the squirrels to protect me. And he would not feel safe in my bombed bunker at the end of the world. Carl and I have been talking for nearly an hour, and our supervision session is almost over. See, at this time in my life, I am a volunteer chaplain at the Veterans Memorial Hospital in North Carolina. At that time, I would meet with Carl for an hour each week to explore various parts of my ego as I prepared to become a priest. On this day, seconds tick away in the silence between us as medical personnel shuffle down the hall with squeaky-wheeled gurneys moving patients to and fro. After a long pause and a deep breath in and a glance up at the clock on the wall, Carl offers one final insight. I don't think the boy and the three girls in the bunker are your siblings. Regardless of whose face the characters in your dream take, he tells me, each person in your dream is you. Each person is some aspect of your psyche. Now, I've had dreams that involve other people my whole life, but I was today years old when I learned that this idea that the people in my dreams could be me, that my siblings represented parts of myself. 
Since that time and these years of being a priest and a spiritual director for others, I have listened to dozens of dream stories. Some are shaped from disquieting fantasies. Others are built on poignant memories. From them, I've learned that so many of the narratives that our minds play over and over center around children, the innocent ones who connect us to the origin of innocence within ourselves. I've also learned that the children for whom we carry the most angst are often not the ones we've brought into this world, although our kids can stress us out. The ones who hold most of our grief and fear are the children inside each one of us. I have met many inner children in my work with adults. I have met the parts of a person who remain wounded and in pain, as well as the parts that remain curious and playful and free. That bunker was for me the first time I ever met the children within me. I learned that that teenager, she's my protector, and she often companions that young boy who refuses to feel his fear. The girls are usually harder for me to find. The youngest one only comes out to play for what brings her joy. And the two middle children, they are constantly seeking out connections with others. These kids are me. And the more I've become aware of the roles each plays within my inner family system, the less I rely on their habits of self-protection and the greater freedom I have and find to respond to the stressors in my adult life. The more I've gotten to know these children, the more access I have gained to my truest self, my beloved self, the core of me who is always confident and compassionate, perpetually transforming and healing in that sacred bunker at the end of the world. And perhaps because I am a priest, or perhaps even more directly, because I am a Christian, this inner work for me is inseparable from my relationship with Jesus. The deeper I have gone into personal therapy and spiritual direction with others, the more clearly I have seen Jesus guiding the inward process of re-examining childhood. See, there is a narrative in the Gospels in the sermons, in the letters of the New Testament that leads the children within us directly into the arms of God. In our oldest gospel, Mark, Jesus literally takes children into his arms. He places his hands on them and he blesses them. You must become like these little children, he tells the adults nearby who will listen. Now, there are two primary Greek words in the New Testament most commonly translated as child. Together, they show up about 150 times. Both words are neuter, meaning they assign no gender to the child. Inherent in these words is the idea that children are not yet fixed. Children are flexible, always growing, always becoming. And I wonder if that's why Jesus will only accept children into the kingdom of God. Because that's the place we must eternally grow. We must eternally grow in love. Jesus plainly tells us that if we can't become like little children, we aren't getting in. Do you remember that story of Nicodemus, that one where he goes to Jesus into the middle, in the middle of the night and he asks him this important question. Do you ever wonder, as I do, what does being born again really mean? What does it really look like? How do I return to my mother's womb and become a child again, Nicodemus asks. But maybe that wasn't the best question. What if access to becoming a child again is closer 
than we first thought? What if there is always already a childlike place within us? Maybe we don't have to go too far after all to enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is already here, right now, within you as you sit in your seat. We don't have to return to the womb. We just have to walk with Jesus into the bunkers and the gardens within ourselves. There is an inward journey toward childhood that each one of us is asked to take when we embrace the Christian spiritual life. And I think that journey is powerful enough to bring about the best imaginable end of the world. See, the prophet Isaiah gives us a picture of what a peaceful closing chapter to this world will look like. The wolf shall live with the lamb, he writes. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. In order to move forward in spiritual life, we must first go backwards. Compared to the physical growth we're used to, spiritual growth is an inverted process. To age in Christ, we must grow younger. So young, in fact, that we are reborn, conceived only by the seed of God's love. When we are born from above, we begin to look more like our heavenly parent than we ever did our earthly ones. Beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children now. This is the line out of today's reading from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God's children grown from the seed of love that comes directly from Jesus' Father. John's entire epistle focuses on this love, this love of God that begets us. And at the end of this same chapter we read from today, we learn that love is not just what God gives to us. God is love. Our new childhoods come from love when we are born again, from a love that is unrecognizable to this world. And maybe that was part of the problem all along. The reason the world does not know us, 1 John tells us, is because it does not know God. The reason the world does not love us as we needed to be loved is because it didn't yet know what love is. But now, love, it's all we have to bring into this world, for it is what we who in Christ are now made of. And we will spend the rest of our lives in this life and in the next learning how to become more and more like love, more and more like God. That's what the epistle writers seem to focus on in their New Testament writings. Jesus and the Gospels draws us to the child. And the apostles then write to help us understand what it means to live as children in God's household because that is where we will live forever. Today's reading from 1 John concludes this way. We who have been born of love are still becoming what we will be. What we will become is not yet known because Christ is not yet fully known to this world. All that we do know is that we will one day be like him. And while we wait for the hope of that day, We work to purify ourselves. We work to return to the innocence from which we came until this world fully understands who love is. I imagine you've noticed the candles today, the reading of the names. 
This is our annual celebration of all saints, the day in the calendar year where we get a glimpse of that last chapter in the story of a Christian life. Today we remember those whose transformation was out of this world and into a new one and is now complete. We remember those who died growing younger every day so that they could enter the kingdom of heaven as children of God. And today is also a baptism Sunday. We have this extra gift of witnessing the moment a child from this world is brought into the family of God. Sienna, you are an example to us of who we are all supposed to become. So let these people inspire you. Let the children just entering this world and the children having just left it guide you on your spiritual journey back to childhood, where God can help you retell the old stories to bring healing and wholeness in ways only love can. Perhaps one day you'll even let a Carl into your life who might help you find the bunker or the garden within yourself, where you can meet your inner family system of children who are hard at work protecting you from those wounds generated by a childhood that did not yet know God's love. Jesus will meet you there and draw each part of you back to the love from which you came. Each child he meets, he will gather in his arms, place his hands upon their heads and bless them, returning each one to the innocence and purity in which they began. There is nowhere else to be now except to be a beloved child of God.